I'm Guy Daniels, Director of Content at Telecom TV, and you're watching our panel discussion on operational experiences and pain points, part of Etsy's NFE Evolution series of programs. Now, as NFE has matured, network service and technology providers have gained experience on operational matters in the development and use of technologies based on the NFE standards. A smart evolution strategy requires that one learns from this experience to guide future steps, not only because it's essential to alleviate the identified pain points, but also to rely on this practical knowledge when trying to identify all kinds of risk, roadblocks and diversions ahead. Now, joining me to discuss the operational experiences of NFV are Diego Lopez, Senior Technology Expert with Telefonica, Marie Paulodini, Distinguished Technologist, HPE Communications and Media Solutions, Hewlett Packard Enterprise. Yoshihiro Nakajima, Manager, Core Network Development Department at NTT Docomo. And Yun Chao Hu, Senior Director, Strategies, Standardization and Industry Development at Huawei Technologies in Dusseldorf. Well, hello everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Now, as we just mentioned, we need to learn from our experience with NFE in order to guide our future steps. So let me ask each of you, as we have deployed NFE, what went well, what didn't go so well, and what lessons have we learned? Diego, perhaps we could uh, start with you. Well, I, I would say just as a summary that that's everything in life, it has been a bittersweet experience with uh with the the, the signs of of sweetness uh, we're about that at the end uh, we, we have set it a new way of thinking about the uh, network services and how to build them and how to to organize them though it has not been as uh, quick and the impact has not been as uh, as uh, deep as we expected at least in the in the in the time of the lifetime of the uh, of NFV that is about to be as close to 10 years, if, uh, roughly speaking. Probably it's a little bit less, but we, we can talk about that decade anyway. Uh, the, um, <clears throat> the, uh, the, the, uh, as I said, is, uh, we, we have found hurdles that are not only technical. For sure, there are technical things where you, you start anything that, uh, that is a new technology. It takes time. It takes time to analyze, which are gaps with the existing uh, technologies and uh, you had to struggle with the uh, with the operational experience but i would say that the main problems have been that uh, well the environment i mean the telco environment is not precisely the most appropriate for revolutions uh, because of several reasons one is that that is because of the nature of the of the network itself we're talking about critical infrastructures we're talking about uh, long, uh, long established uh, uh, legacies that are difficult to 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 uh, uh, change, and the, the industry itself. Uh, the last uh, revolution it went through was during the, the introduction of the new mobile telecommunication, etc. And the solution that the uh, most of the operators, if not all, followed was to build a completely new network. Uh, I joined Telefonica 18 years ago, almost uh, to start with uh, precisely with NFE and all the like. And it was surprising for, to me to find that uh, the mobile network and the fixed networks were essentially separated. And uh, well, this time we were not able to do so. And, and this is something that has been precisely the main pain points have come in the, in the, in the touch points with the existing infrastructure, with the existing services, with the new services that were enabled by the um, by the advent of NV, and there are still challenges that we have to uh, uh, we will have to deal with. Uh, though at the end, I'm able to say that the balance, at least to me, that I'm, uh, probably is because I'm uh, optimistic by nature, is that the, the balance is good. We are starting. We are, we are witnessing the start of a, of a very deep transformation, not as deep as we expected, not as quick as we as we expected. Not as uh, uh, not, not as, as as much a revolution as we expected, but uh, uh, another factor for for revolution. Thank you, Diego, and Marie Paul. Um, what, in your opinion, went well? What perhaps didn't go well? And and what lessons have you taken away from the the progress we've made on NFE to date? 
Well, I would say that um, I, I think the good uh, lesson is that uh, it's been adopted and uh, now it's really mainstream, you know, for operators. Um, it's always in the RFPs and we're working, you know, with uh, every service provider, uh, I mean, knows about NAV and, uh, and deploys NAV. Uh, what uh, took some time was the, the adoption of the full Etsy NAV uh, blueprint. So we really uh, started with uh, NFVI deployment and uh, most operators, uh, they have kind of a streamline on, uh, on NFVI uh, and they have really decoupled hardware from uh, software um, with a virtualization layer. So I think this went pretty well and uh, we've been you know, very active in most of the accounts uh, providing this type of solutions. Uh, and then with the Veeam as well. The Veeam has been uh, you know, very successful uh, Day one, uh, of course, you know, there's been uh, some challenges uh, between the products and the open source and uh, all these new releases coming, you know, every six months or so, you know, of a new version and, uh, you know, having to deal with that and making choices on the version and, and adapting, you know, with, um, you know, the environment. Uh, but, but this is, I think, uh, pretty mature now. Uh, what took more time uh, was the rest of the NAV Mano. Um, so we started, you know, with a resource orchestration, and this is now quite common uh, with most service providers, uh, especially with some of the services that uh, have started, you know, to adopt NAV, uh, things like virtual CPs, things like uh, virtual EPC, especially, you know, maybe some dedicated virtual EPC for IoT, uh, because I mean, still lots of operators, as uh, Diego was mentioning, you know, Add legacy, so EPC was already there, um, and uh, it's not so easy to justify the business case, you know, to move to NAV. So most of, I mean, lots of operators had to find the proper business case for NAV, uh, which is probably one of the reasons why it took some time to actually have Etsy NAV, you know, uh, really coming to reality. And then, of course, there was 5G. Uh, which uh, adopted HCNV uh, and with, uh, you know, the free GPP HCNV uh, alignment, uh, I think it's been uh, really uh, stimulating uh, the market uh, in terms of uh, NAV deployment. Uh, and so it's also been uh, stimulating uh, moving up into the NAV manual uh, stack uh, to the uh, NSO uh, function of the NAV orchestrator. And still, uh, of course, you know, uh, complementing that with service orchestration. Maybe, I mean, and I know that something that I've been uh, trying to push in uh, HCNAV uh, almost since the beginning, uh, what we faced uh, in deployments was um, the, the fact that, you know, HCNAV was not really uh, dealing uh, with the connectivity uh, and the integration with uh, SDN and, and so on. So in most of the deployments, we had to complement the HCNV blueprint with a service orchestration that would uh, bridge, uh, you know, the, the RAN with the core and so on and deal uh, with uh, the SDN controllers and so on. And, and this part, because it's not really standardized, uh, has been, um, you know, somewhat a uh, kind of case by case or up to the vendor implementation. Um, Apart from that, I would say, you know, that uh, now the market is uh, much more aware of HCNV and uh, what it means, but still, we still see some operators uh, and, and yeah, people in the industry which still need to be educated. So I think it's good that you know, HCNV is providing uh, some uh, training capabilities. Uh, I myself, you know, had to deliver some trainings uh, to operators and so on, just to make sure that everybody was a bit aligned on, on the objectives. And, uh, and as we see, you know, the evolution towards 5G um, and the cloud native, uh, we probably now have a new generation of HCNV uh, to be much more container and uh, cloud native um, focused. Thank you, Marie-Paul. Um, I'm sure we'll get back to the, you know, the, the future of NFE and, and this, this next generation, where we go next. Um, but, but for now, Yoshihiro, what about you? What do you think in, in your experience, what went well and perhaps what didn't go so well so far in our NFE story? So uh, our Docomo has uh, uh, introduced the NFV system uh, since uh, 2015. Uh, 15. And uh, the first target is uh, EPC. 
uh, and uh, we expand the NFP scale uh, to meet our uh, network services like uh, uh, IMS, uh, HSS, uh, lots of services are already virtualized. And uh, recently, uh, our virtualization percentage of uh, mobile core network system is going to uh, 50%. And uh, our Docomo thinks the NHP is a normal case in the, and also uh, we try to uh, introduce a new technology like uh, 5GC, uh, other uh, fundamental uh, mobile network system for next decade. And uh, also, uh, we get a lot of benefit from uh, introducing NFP system. Um, well, first one is a lower TCO cost, and we can reduce the uh, hardware cost uh, with uh, decoupling the software and the hardware uh, using the code servers. And also, we can improve the operational efficiency, like. Uh, you know, the NFP provide a kind of auto-healing mechanism. In the past, uh, we need to uh, go to the several data center to fix the hardware failure. But now uh, we can uh, automate such kind of uh, labor uh, processes by automation tool or uh, other manual capabilities. And also, uh, we think uh, NFB, uh, uh, you know, the HNFB has a lot of progress in the standardization to realize the life cycle management of NFB system. Um, that will be great for the merge vendor configuration in the telecom space, especially uh, our uh, infrastructure, NFB infrastructure is a uh, uh, unified uh, for the multi vendor applications. And the uh, life cycle of the application is done by the unified way. So that uh, allows us to control such kind of uh, application from the center side. So we can yeah, reduce the uh, di differentiated uh, rate of the uh, management and uh, uh, so we can uh, simplify such kind of uh, system. Thank you, Yoshihiro. And finally, Yun Chao, um, your thoughts as to what lessons we've learned and what went well and perhaps what didn't go so well? Yeah, that's a good reflection on, on uh, what, what we have done. I mean, uh, we, we participated actually in the first NFV meeting uh, quite some, some time ago already in that, in that area. And, and it started with, with uh, let's say, the, the understanding that we would like to go to the hardware software separation in the telecom functions, and, uh, et cetera, uh, like Marie Paul already mentioned. And I think this is one of, of the success factors that we have done and managed, uh, let's say, what we call the NFVI, so the infrastructure perspective of NFV. Um, when it comes to, to uh, cloudification, uh, we're already there in that perspective as well. Uh, when I left NFV, there was a lot of discussions on, on cloud native applications and, and infrastructure that need to be supported uh, in, in, in the NFV area. So uh, th there's already quite some successful, let's say, uh, standardization specification work. Um, also, the the impact that NFV had in, in other areas, like in the 5G evolution, is of course a very important one, where you see cloudification of functionalities has been driven, let's say, by the concepts and principles of NFV as well. So I think it's a, it's a good, let's say, um, evaluation of, of how NFV is used and, and et cetera. And, uh, looking into the different perspectives of, of uh, uh, the, 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 the usage of NFV in a deployed environment. Uh, of course, simplification of uh, operational, uh, let's say, uh, uh, functionalities would be needed in, in, that, in that area. It is still cumbersome to, to drive, let's say, 
and 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 could uh, let's say NFE deployment in, in that area. But this is let's say what we are working on, uh, not only by the ISG NFE but also other ISGs uh, within Etsy are working on that, like for instance the zero touch management capabilities uh, that are there. Um, there is of course one important aspect that that maybe we have not realized so much as we intended to do. In, in the beginning, uh, let's say in the first white paper, we, we thought about a marketplace of uh, uh, network function for, uh, functionalities that could be easily be deployed in the different areas uh, for, uh, uh, let's say, uh, on top of an uh, NFE infrastructure. I think uh, plug and play is, is not that easy to do in, in that area. So it, it is still uh, some improvements that we could work on that in, in, in the future in that, uh, as well. Then I think um, NFE is, is of course uh, triggered and, and driven by, by the, 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 let's say the carrier, the, the, the operator, let's say uh, perspectives. Um, now, since I left NFE already some four years ago, I went into the industry vertical, let's say, standardization uh, in that area. And there is a lot of, uh, let's say, opportunities and also uh, possibilities for NFE to, to drive the integration of ICT and operational technologies, OT technologies in that perspective as well in that area. Um, it's common now that, that uh, a certain specific functionality uh, could be fertilized, could be more easier, let's say, made available in a cloud environment. We need to look into how this will match to, to different, let's say, edge environment as well in that, in that area that is not only the edge boundary of a telecom operator, but could also edge boundaries of industry uh, vertical domains, like, for instance, uh, machines in, in smart manufacturing, or, or turbines and, and smart energy, et cetera, where you see the integration of ICT and OT also happening more and more in that perspective. Uh, but in, in, in general, I would say that um, uh, although, uh, of course, there are challenges today, but there are also success factors for, for NFV, uh, as I mentioned, separation of hardware software, uh, driving, let's say, the, the, the containerization of, of the infrastructure, uh, which makes it more possible to drive into native cloud, uh, let's say, support for different applications. We could, let's say, improve ourselves to, to a kind of an uh, open, transparent environment where different uh, functionalities, network functions could be made available. And in this context, I think also uh, evolution towards the uh, towards the, the, the operational technologies uh, could be beneficial to NFE as a concept and as a, uh, let's say, as a solution for uh, cloudification of different operational technologies as well in, in industry verticals. Thank you, Yuncho, uh, and all of you, in fact. You know, you've all been so closely involved with, uh, with NFE over the years, and it's great to hear your assessments of, of where we are now. Um, Marie Paul, if I could move on now to. We've all talked about the hurdles that remain in, in bringing NFE deployments into reality. You've mentioned, for instance, um, justifying the business case um, is, is often one of them for telcos. But to what extent have the NFE standards contributed to either clear these hurdles or perhaps inadvertently cause more problems? Um, even internally, you know, uh, internally, HP, we have a telco portfolio uh, on the core of the network. Uh, 4G and now 5G. And so even internally to uh, convince my colleagues, you know, to really move the portfolio to NFV, I had to convince them to go through the specs and read the Etsy specs. And it was quite, uh, you know, a challenge because it's uh, lots of work and uh, it's lots of specification and so on. And it's a bit the same for the operators, you know, to understand what it means for them to move to NFV. They have to understand a bit, you know, what it means in terms of NAVI, of NAV Mano, all these different interfaces. What do they need to request to the vendors? So, I mean, in, in the end, it's, it's a bit complex. And if you add to that, uh, you know, the fact that you have different uh, implementations um, and these different implementations may have specifics uh, asking for a different container format, uh, 
having some additional capabilities and so on and and being updated you know with the agile model you know every few months uh, that that adds uh you know a bit of uh, of complexity um but i mean this being said uh once people have understood you know uh, what it means then they understand you know the benefit of uh having these standardized interfaces and being able to request a special uh, package format uh, to vendors and a special descriptor format. And then they have, you know, the automated, the centralized lifecycle management, which then makes things much easier than having to deal, you know, with each uh, individual solution, uh, like in a silo. So, um, I mean, there is a bit of effort upfront, but once you've done that, uh, I think as Docomo mentioned, you know, there is a real benefit of having a, a much more flexible and centralized uh, management of the end-to-end -end infrastructure. So not just not just the core, because as we see, you know, the RAN is being virtualized as well, and so it's like your end-to-end -end network that is being uh, virtualized and can be managed centrally, including uh, going to the enterprise, as I've mentioned. Your virtual CPE is a good example, and then as we see, you know, uh, the evolution to make, which is also uh, virtualized platforms, uh, and uh, and we have the good alignment, you know, between Etsy Make and uh, and Etsy NFV, which is also embracing uh, NFV uh, platform and lifecycle management, uh, and so does uh, GSMA. You know, I'm spending some time right now on the telco platform for GSMA, and and we have also a good alignment with uh, with Etsy NFV. So all you know, all in all, that that kind of um, standardized, you know, the overall um, operator infrastructure around this uh, NFV blueprint that, you know, we defined uh, eight years ago or some, some years ago already. Good to hear, Mary Paul. And yes, as you say, about eight, eight years ago now, um, a lot's happened since then. Anybody else like to comment on the uh, the role that standards, NFE standards are, are playing as we try and remove hurdles to, to wider NFE deployments? Diego? Well, uh <clears throat> I'd say on the, in the, on the first uh, side, something that I insist very much when talking about the telco sector is that it's, uh, well, probably not completely unique, but especially in the sense that we are obliged to collaborate, directly collaborate with our competitors to provide the service we're expected. I mean, our customers expect us to collaborate with our competitors, which is something that is not usual if you think about it in, in other, in other uh, industries. <clears throat> and that, that cooperative nature makes standards essential. I mean, it's something that is so much inside the culture of the telcos that without a standard and without showing that there is a standard, there is a reasonable consensus among the industry at large, uh, vendors, operators, regulators, integrators, etc. Uh, it's, it's difficult to, to, to even to make any simple technology transformation happen. Something, something like NAV would have been, I would say, essentially impossible without the support of standards. For sure, doing standards mean that you have to agree things with others, uh, with others that have different needs, different goals, different uh, views of the world, and that uh, requires time. And that, uh, for sure, that uh, uh, somehow uh, slows down the, uh, the process. So. Uh, at the end, without the standards, probably we, we would not be here. Uh, and, and well, there, there would be about some experiments, some particular services being run by certain operators, no more than that. And what, on the other hand, without standards, those uh, who uh, would have been bold enough to move in that direction probably would have uh, uh, reached uh, the, 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 that destination uh, faster. But uh, I don't. I don't think that they would be the, the uh, result would be much better. Thank you, Diego. Um, yeah, Yun Chao. Yeah, maybe I can give a different perspective to this as well. Uh, I think the the concept of NFV and also the standardization of NFV has, uh, let's say, uh, shortened the, the the life cycle of infrastructure, telecom infrastructure, as. Uh, we can state that maybe in the in the traditional telecom infrastructure, we see that they uh, we have let's say this uh, five year life cycle of new features. Uh, you can think about the the, the traditional days of ISDN, uh, where this was included in that perspective. 
But uh, now with NFV, we could, let's say, have rapidly, more rapidly introduction of new features, new functionalities uh, that would be important for uh, for the deployment of, of uh, let's say, an, an telecom infrastructure in that perspective. And also uh, uh, shorten the life cycle quite considerably, let's say, to, to uh, between one to one and a half year, where you could, let's say, have new functions made available by means of standards and also by the different implementations as well in that in that perspective. So I think it's important to realize that the, the change of, of technology is of course very rapidly evolving all the time. And uh, you can now think also but with the new uh, uh, different concept, not only edge computing, like the mobile edge computing uh, that, uh, Mac uh, that is there, but also AI introduction, et cetera, is of course a new area where we see uh, uh, quite some new uh, innovations happening at this moment. Thank you for that, Yunxiao. Well, alongside the standards work, we've also been progressing with Prusa concepts and, and plug tests. Yoshihira, I, I wonder if, if I could um, ask you a question about those and, and ask you, you know, what do you think has been the usefulness of POCs, proof of concepts, and early interoperability assessments such as plug tests as part of the overall Etsy NFE process? Mm, I think, uh, yeah, practice, it's a great chance to see the what's there uh, many application run the same language. Uh, it's a specification of the Etsy NFV. Um, usually the integration, it's a much, much difficult to uh, for us um, because uh, if we uh handle the multiple vendor applications uh we need to talk each uh vendors but uh using the some outcome of the hgnfb specification so we can reduce the such a uh, big uh, integration cost and of course um the practice will uh reduce such kind of uh pre integration processes because um, you know the onboarding cost. Uh, usually, we spend uh, half years or one year uh, to discuss with uh, vendors to for the packaging life cycle uh, sequence. A lot of uh, uh, property are uh, integrated or discussed uh, for the, just for the life cycle management. So. Using the uh, outcome of the uh, practice, uh, we can uh, we can see them. Oh, new application can be integrated easily to the existing system. So that will be great. That's good to hear. Anybody else like to comment on the the role that POX have played, and also that that plug tests continue to play in the process? Just uh, no, just to mention a couple of things. Uh, plug test is uh, going on, and, and, the, and the thing I like uh, best of it is that plug tests are, are evolving, like uh, Nakajima san was saying, into into application integration. And, and plug tests right now include Mac applications, or, or they have been collaborating with other initiatives like uh, CNTT from the Linux Foundation, for example, in the past. And uh, on the other hand, when it comes to pr proof of, of concept, at the beginning, where they were simply that proof of concept. But right now, uh, what I think is even even well even more important right now is about involving the research community. There is a lot of things still open that we have to play with and that we have to uh, get some sense in which the direction of the uh, of the standards uh, should, uh, should what the direction of the standard should be. And in that respect, relying on the uh, on research groups and research projects is something important. And, and, and right now, proof of concept, uh, the proof of concept uh, framework is becoming a way of showing the results of this uh, research. Thanks, Diego. Uh, any any more, more comments about uh, the role of, of plug tests? And as Diego mentioned, you know, trying to involve uh, the research community more. Mary Paul? Definitely. I think uh, the POC uh, framework and the plug test are. Uh, that we've been doing for years now has been critical to the success of HCNV. I think, especially you know, uh, at the beginning and as we were expanding the scope and uh, getting more vendors to really prove a point, you know, the integrations and uh, and the the gaps also on some interfaces and so on. Um, 
Now, as Diego mentioned, you know, uh, I think it's more to reach out to the broader community. Um, if I speak, you know, uh, on behalf of HP, um, I mean, now, we, you know, we have, um, we are involved in projects, you know, we get exposed to uh, many vendors that we have to integrate in operators network with our NFV orchestrator, with, uh, you know, our platforms and so on. So it's not like we need to go to a plug test, you know, to get this exposure. But we have a number of other people uh, which either provide a VNF, you know, for the Mac or the research community, the open source community and so on which uh, really benefit from having this plug test and, uh, and POC, I think. And, uh, and so then, you know, the more experienced people can, can help with that. Um, so, yeah, I, I think it's, uh, it's got, you know, different uh, roles for different type of uh, actors in the industry. And it's definitely a, a, great, a great tool to continue to, uh, to have. I think one thing that was... Uh, uh, um realizing for, for, for me is, is not only that we as vendors of course participated in, in many of these proof of concept just to, to demonstrate let's say the, the technical feasibilities of different concepts that we had standardized um, and, and also try to understand the different additional requirements that would be needed in, in the different areas like for instance in the ICT open source capabilities like for instance, uh, the new uh, enhancements that would be needed in K8S uh, Kubernetes uh, type of uh, open source uh, to make it more reliable, to have it higher performance capabilities there. But one other thing which is important to realize, and I don't know if the others has, has let's say, uh, the, uh, has, has realized that as well, that when we started with the proof of concept, I think we also introduced al or, or alerted or stimulated uh, more players to come into the NFV standardization as well in that perspective. You see suddenly smaller companies, innovative, uh, let's say, solutions that they are providing coming into the NFV area and, and really uh, uh, um, contributing that to the standardization area as well. So you suddenly you go from the traditional companies or participants that are there, let's say, in the standardization arena in Etsy and, and others, you had also a new inf uh, in, um, uh, inflow of, of different type of players as well into the standardization domain uh, in, in that perspective. So it enriched the ecosystem. Thank you. Uh, so has anybody else seen this, the, the, the influx of, of new players? Um, is, is this beneficial? And how exactly is it beneficial to the, the development and deployment of NFV? Yeah, uh, well, I think I think this is one of the foundational uh, ideas behind NFV. It was precisely to try to open up a little bit uh, the playground, so so new players uh, could come. And it is always ben beneficial to have fresh ideas, to have uh, some uh, what new new kids on the block uh, bringing bringing what they what, what they want to play with. That is not translated. I mean, from time to time, uh, and, and I guess that in, in many other cases, it's about uh, the management of expectations, because in a certain moment, probably people were expecting that uh, the uh, offer of uh, services, I mean, of, of software and implementations, etc., would translate into instead of having 10 pro potential providers, we, we would end up having 100 and it's very much connected with this idea of the marketplaces etc that uh, Jun Chao was mentioning before uh, it has been different in that sense I mean it has been that the, the number of providers has expanded a little bit but then the dynamics of the market at acquisitions and the like have uh, played against that about, about this uh, growth so at the end I would say it's good because it's uh, expanded uh, let's say mines or are, 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 are brought uh, new ingredients to the uh, uh, to the idea broth, but uh, but but it has not translated into a much higher diversity of the uh, of the offer, which is not bad. I mean, it's a uh, it's a it's, it's part of the of what it was intended. If you analyze uh, in depth how the market is right now. Well, let, let's look forward a bit now, if we can. Um... Oh, Mary Paul. No, no, I, I just wanted to, um, yeah, to, I mean, to reinforce the, the initial goal, you know, of uh, HCNV, which was created as an ASG to really bring, you know, these new players. 
And, uh, and it's true that at the beginning, we had quite a few new players which came, but then they were a bit uh, afraid, you know, by the standardization process and so on, and the time and resources that this requires. Um, so we didn't keep so many uh, small players, you know, in the process. But then in the industry, we had uh, quite a few um, actors which uh, became now quite uh, relevant uh, in the market. So they are not maybe, you know, as um, as popular or as common as, you know, the, the big players. Uh, but still, I think they are quite, uh, I mean, they are quite mature now. They have solutions which have been deployed and which are robust and so on. We are working with a few of them uh, to provide uh, uh, full core, uh, 4G, 5G core, uh, um, and evolving to the cloud native uh, environments with 5G core. And they are really bold uh, people, uh, very, I mean, with credibility in the market. And it's also true in the RAN. Uh, so I, I mentioned the VRAN, and, and there I see, you know, quite a, a number of new players. And, and I would say that these people probably have also a good opportunity with the evolution uh, towards uh, private networks, which is, uh, I mean, Yun Chao was mentioning the verticals, and uh, and it's true that both for the verticals and, and also. Uh, you know, for uh, smart, I mean, yeah, it's a vertical, but there's a number of uh, use cases for private networks and, um, and there are opportunities for these uh, smaller players uh, in this context uh, with NAV solutions. So I think overall, you know, uh, it's still, you know, uh, it's good and uh, it's something that uh, has happened and, uh, and is bringing value to the market in terms of uh, yeah, having more choice and, uh, and giving opportunity to other business opportunities for new companies or other companies. That's good. That's good. Thank you. Um, Yoshihiro, hopefully, hopefully I can ask this question to, to you. Um, how do you see the community addressing the relationship between NFV and SDN? Can we ever get to a stage where there might be a, a convergence in a, a kind of unified theory between the two? Is that even possible? Yeah, I think um, integration between the NFB to uh, SDN is uh, much, much important because, uh, you know, telecom requirement, uh, lots of uh, network should be integrated to the uh, one system. Uh, mm -hmm. Actually, the fragmentation of the NFB system and uh, other uh, network is a very difficult uh, difficult situation. So I think uh, for the future, um, the integrated uh, management, uh, including the application of the telecom telecommunications and uh, networking will be um, important. And also for the autom automation or end-to-end uh, -end orchestration, uh, we need to control both of the uh, system. Uh, but, uh, you know, we need to collaborate with uh, other standardization bodies like uh, uh, IATF, MEF, uh, to uh, get the common agreement to realize the end-to-end -end automation. Thank you. And any other thoughts about um, the possibility of a kind of unified theory between SDN and NFE? I mean, I've been talking about that since uh, almost the beginning, you know, when I triggered this uh, work item on SDN integration. And still, you know, eight years later, we still talk about it. Uh, and uh, as uh, I mean, Docomo mentioned, there's still, you know, lots of fragmentation. There are many um, standardization body and, uh, and still, you know, 3GPP still doesn't consider transport as being in scope of 3GPP. And uh, as vendors, we have to deal with that on a case by case. And, uh, and that's you know, why we have our service orchestration on top of NAV Mano. And we are, I mean, doing the integration with uh, SDN controllers, you know, uh, in this matter. And we need to, uh, I mean, build the uh, information model uh, uh, to deal with that. Uh, we, I mean, as we work also on uh, zero touch management, you know, with ETSI-ZSM and we're quite active there. This is, yeah, this is a hot topic uh, for sure. And, uh, and still, you know, I mean, being uh, worked in different um, 
standardization bodies or industry um, forums. And um, yeah, it's a, it's a tough topic. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, uh, Diego, uh, it is indeed a tough topic. It's been talked about for a, for a long time. Do you, do you think we could make progress here, though? We, I mean, I, I think we should. We, we should, and therefore we, we will be able to one way or another. The point is uh, how you express the, I mean, my, my, my take is that at the end, what we will need is a, well, when you mentioned this unified theory, what we need is a unified view of what a network is and, and how you build the services of the network. Because at the end, uh, uh, well, NFV or what we know right now as NFV, which is the, the separation of hardware and software, implementation by software and composition, lifecycle management, etc. And at the end, that is about how you configure connectivity and the different uh, functionality along a particular path. If you think about that, they are separated. I mean, they, they, they are. But on the other hand, you can unify them precisely in a common view of the network, in the network as a, managing the network as a way in which you deal with it as a, as a, as a higher stretching level. Then whether you're using mano or, or any V mano actions or you're using any SDN um, commands, etc. This is something that goes into into a level of detail that would not be in the at the level of the, you are managing the network services. Doing this, yeah, it's, it's something that we need to go. I mean, and there are there are experiences there, there are experiments that have been run, there are proposals. M many of them they are around something that probably is a term that has been a little bit overused. Uh, this is intent based networking and all the like, probably because uh, as many other things in life. Uh, when, when talking about intent or declaring intent for the network, there are many potential meanings. But this this idea of having a higher level of abstraction with a common uh, network view and a network service view is something that is a way to go. Great. And Yun Chao, do you think it's time we, we changed our view and, and, and uh, removed this separation between NFE and SDN in terms of how we, how we take this high level view of our networks? I don't think we should uh, remove the, the, let's say, the, the one or the other in, in that perspective. I think they are complementary to each other. As as Diego already mentioned, uh, SDN is about the connectivity in, in the network and the programmability of the of the different connections in, in your network, while NFV is more about flexible deployment of new network functions in, in that perspective. So I think it's quite complementary to each other. However, they are based a little bit on different paradigms, different perspectives, uh, and unfortunately driven by different organizations, ONF and, and, and Etsy uh, in, in that area. And I think this is, uh, let's say, uh, one of the uh, challenges to, to bring the two different concepts together. I think that's why it's quite hard, as, as uh, Marie Paul mentioned uh, in, in that area. I mean, we did a very intensive study on, on based on the work item expressed by, by Marie Paul. Uh, but in the end, uh, still yeah. the, there are a lot of technical, let's say, challenges to overcome in that perspective. So I think it's it's uh, it's a uh, uh, hard ball to do. However, I fully agree with with, uh, with Diego that this is an area where we need to 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 bridge the differences, uh, let's say, between SDN and NFE and really. Uh, work on that, and by by a market demand, uh, of course, we will follow what the, what the demand is, and and solutions will be provided. Thank you very much. Uh, well, for our final question, then, Marie Paul, you mentioned earlier in our discussion uh, about future paths for for NFE uh, and embracing containers, etc. Um, what about the the ongoing move towards cloud native in our industry? Marie Paul, how do you define what's happening here and what is needed for the NFE community to, to embrace this and move forward? Yeah, that's a very hot topic <laughs> because we clearly see, uh, you know, a major trend uh, in this industry. I mean, we have built a 5G core and it's cloud native. Um, and, uh, and we see, you know, this uh, moving uh, you know, uh, in every part of the network, even the the RAN, you know, I mean, it started with VMs for the VRAN and so on, and more and more people are talking containers for the RAN itself. So uh, this this move to something which is uh, simpler uh, than the VMs, uh, for sure, 
which uh, in terms of cost, you know, uh, it's a bit cheaper. Uh, and uh, in terms of uh, access to a technology and so on, it's, uh, I mean, yeah, it's more affordable. And so in, in the end, uh, we need to embrace that. Uh, so HCNV has started to uh, really uh, uh, have some specification to explain, you know, how NFV uh, can be applied or can be expanded a bit uh, to support uh, cloud native environments. Uh, but we probably need to go a bit beyond and still we have uh, still this challenge between, uh, you know, the theory of uh, standardization and specs and so on uh and implementations and uh and some uh, kind of de facto standard platforms that we see in the market which also drive uh you know uh, behavior and uh, requirements so that's uh yeah that's really an, an area that uh, uh probably needs uh, more work uh from etcnv to really align with what is going on uh in the cloud native environment and provide uh proper tools you know for uh, for either, you know, vendors, uh, but also operators. And, um, and to me, I mean, this is, uh, this is definitely, you know, a, a good move as well, uh, because everything which simplifies, uh, the deployment and the operation of a network, uh, is good. Uh, and, uh, and the footprint of containers, I think, you know, uh, it's, uh, commonly, you know, accepted that, um, this is, uh, a very good model, you know, to have something that can scale down and can uh, also uh, grow, uh, um, you know, as we get, you know, more traffic and so on, and it's, you know, very agile, um, which brings me to another important topic, which is the energy efficiency of our networks. I think, uh, you know, this, um, I mean, this coming years and, uh, and already, you know, starting now, uh, this uh, is uh, top of the mind of, uh, I mean, most of the operators and uh, vendors as well. Um, and we can really benefit from uh, not just NLV, but also this cloud native environment um, to optimize the footprint, to optimize the, uh, uh, the workload, the migrations and so on, uh, to really reduce um, the um, environmental impact overall of our networks and uh, and to me this is you know one of the big uh, focus we should have with all these technologies thank you and yoshihiro what do you think is needed for for the nfe community to to embrace and, and prepare for cloud native architectures um cloud native is a very attractive uh, way uh, technologies so, but we think uh, we need to think about how to introduce a new technology like a cloud native uh, container and uh, some application decompositions and microservices. So, lots of pieces are um, so we have, and uh, we need to think about how to provide um, very long term uh, operations like. Uh, you know the cloud native technology is to accelerate the development speed but you know the telecom business services so we need to keep the long uh, stable communication service to the customers of course uh, for the cloud native application we need to introduce a new uh, infrastructure to support cloud native application like uh, Kubernetes and uh, lots of uh, path functionalities. So the so we are uh, we try to run um, practice um, a lot uh, on the uh, cloud how to cloud how to handle the cloud native application in telecom uh, telecommunications. Also, uh, for the operational point of view, we need to. Uh, change a little bit uh, to the existing uh, workflow to accept the cloud native application. So because, you know, the cloud native application is a more scalable, dynamic, and uh, lots of uh, tools are introduced. But for the uh, simplicity of the operation, uh, we need to uh, simplify such a uh, uh, way uh, 
combination of the tools and the libraries and the environment. Um, so that's why we need a, a general rule uh, to uh, application uh, for the infrastructure usage or networking. So we need to uh, collaborate with a standardization body to find a good way to handle such kind of application. And also networking uh, connectivity is a much, much important. And uh, you know, the container application uh, try to uh, simplify the networking between the uh, applications, like uh, service mesh or something. And uh, lots of tech, network tech, technique are used in the implementation of the content application. Uh, but you know, the telecom application needs a, a handle to, for the uh, complex networking to the uh, existing networking system. So we need to fill such kind of gaps uh, for the uh, future applic uh, content application and cloud native application in telecom telecommunications. Thank you. And, and Yun Chao, how do we ensure within the NFE community that we, we support current implementations in our telecoms networks and at the same time make this future proof, make this uh, suitable for all cloud native methodologies and architectures? Well, first of all, uh, we need to, to, to use uh, the, the capabilities uh, that are provided by, let's say, from the IT perspective. So uh, Kubernetes is, of course, one, one, one strong example of that. However, we also need to look into what are the dedicated, let's say, needs uh, from, uh, let's say, uh, reliability, performance, or carrier grade type of capability that need to be supported as well. And normally they are not very well supported in an IT environment in that, in that perspective because they are more related to the telecom uh, perspective. So I think it's, it's important that we drive indeed uh, those type of enhancements uh, within their, uh, let's say, solutions in that area. So this is a combination of standardization, but also open source development that needs to be done in that area. And I think uh, this is a domain where uh, this, this, uh, let's say, harmony between uh, standardization and open source is, is, of course, an important factor. So, so yeah, uh, Diego, uh, what are your thoughts about how NFV can properly support um, the move towards more cloud native in telecoms? Well, I, I believe that the important thing here is that we have to know where, where, where are the, uh, uh, where we want to go and in which, uh, which is the direction we have to follow. I, I, I see three different directions. For, for the first one is related precisely with the idea of uh, taking advantage of what uh, uh, the uh, technologies in IT or the evolution of technologies uh, in IT when it comes to uh, Kubernetes, containers, and all the like uh, bring. This is something that I believe is directly applicable in the cases of uh, precisely of those network functions that are very close to the kind of environments as you see in, in uh, in the uh, IT world, in web services, and all the like, and this is this is the case for many of the uh, of the uh, of the functions that the control plane or the control planes, depending on how you uh, count uh, count them. And in this case, I, I would try to go that, that way precisely. Let's follow what the uh, what IT is doing and, and, and let's use it and not uh, try to avoid to invent anything that is not needed. Probably some uh, some aspects about resiliency. Uh, it would be necessary, but no more than that. The second direction is something that is precisely about uh, trying to facilitate and that uh, trying to facilitate uh, a data plane that is composable and is fast enough while based on software. And that would imply, for example, to consider new technologies like, for example, programmable data planes, things like P4, like eBPF, etc., and how they are related to the orchestration mechanisms uh, that uh, we have right now in, in place and how we can integrate these with the orchestration of the rest of the, uh, of the functions and how we can decompose functions in components that are suitable for this. And uh, there is a third direction that probably is the most, uh, let's say for further research, that is uh, precisely how we build a continuum, a continuum of uh, IT and network solutions that are able to be jointly orchestrated and, and are fully 
uh, if, if you like, not only cloud native, but cloud plus network native or, or whatever we call it. So you can think about any distributed application as a combination of these, uh, of these components in the future. So as a summary, th th there are so uh, uh, short term goals, um, but uh, we have ahead an interesting road as well for, lo for the long term. Thanks, Diego. I'm sure we do. We, we need to end our panel discussion now, but thank you to all of you for sharing your views and insights into the progress of NFE and its ongoing evolution. The NFE Evolution Programme Series is brought to you by Etsy, produced by Telecom TV and sponsored by Huawei. We've got a wealth of content available for you to watch, including several presentations and an interview with Etsy NFE ISG Chair Bruno Chatteris, and you can access all programs on demand here on Telecom TV. Coming up next is our live Q&A discussion program. So please submit your questions and we'll try to answer as many as we can. We'll see you again very soon. Don't go away.